If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask to turn to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 6, and we're going to begin our reading in verse 15, Ezra chapter 6, uh, and uh, while you're turning there, uh, again, remember all our missionaries, um, uh, I believe uh, Brother, uh, well, I'm a blank, uh, Brother Fayard made it uh, well through the hurricane, it kind of went to the east of him, so he's in good shape with that. Ezra chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Ezra chapter 6, beginning in verse 15, the Bible says, And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth month of the reign of Darius the king. And the children of Israel, and the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy and offered the dedication of this house of God a hundred bullocks, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs for sin offering for all Israel, twelve he goats according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is in Jerusalem as it is written in the book of Moses. And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the fourteenth day of the first month. So the priests and the Levites were purified together, all of them were pure, and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity, and for their brethren and priests, and for themselves. And the children of Israel, which were come again out of the captivity, and all such as had separated themselves unto, uh, unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did eat. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to meet with your people, God, and we praise you for that. This morning we pray uh, specifically that you'd come down and that you'd minister to our hearts, Lord, in the and the realness of the Spirit, Lord, we pray for that. God, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do, for each time that you meet with us. Lord, we give you great glory and honor for that. And we pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'll be uh, uh, preaching this morning in power at Why Don't We Have Any Power? You know, if you go from church to church, what I found, and even traveling over recently into North Carolina, our churches are not like they were 20 years ago. Uh, our, sur our churches certainly are not what they were 30 years ago. Uh, there's a lack of power in prayer. There's a lack of power in service. There's a lack of power in preaching. And, and, and we need that back. If we're, content, if we're to continue in the last day in which we live, we'll continue by the power of the Almighty. Right. Otherwise, we'll right. be overrun. Yeah. And, and, and so what happened? I think that's a very needful question. What happened to our power? Mm. Where, where did it go? And we find that Israel answer, asked this question. Uh, listen, they were in a mess in the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. Listen, they were living in captivity. They, they did not have an independent nation anymore. And you know what? We as the Lord's people in 2020 largely were a people that lived in captivity. Now, when I say that, don't, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean lack of salvation. Because see, these Israelites that were there, really they were a lot of the ones that were left and didn't get taken in. And then a, great, uh, a number of them came back and helped rebuild the city. But they were still Israelites. They were still Jewish. They, still had, they were still God's people, but they lacked power. You know what? We're still the Lord's people, but when you travel about, our churches lack power. They lack power in preaching. They lack power in service. And so what our desperate need in 2020 is to regain power that was lost. Find out what happened 
and then remedying his problem, and that's exactly what Israel did. In verse 15, we'll go back and review our text. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar. Now, that month of Adar, or Adar, however you say it, corresponds with our march very closely. Now, the Jews had a 28-day calendar, a little bit different than ours, but very close to the same day, and they had been working for a long time. Now, if you want a closeness with the Lord, you're going to have to work a long time. If I understand the Jewish calendar like I think I do, they've been there about four months in their, in their repair of the temple. Now, they've not even got out to the city yet. They were just repairing the temple. Now, what does the Bible say in the New Testament is the temple of the Lord? This body, right? Mm -hmm. Amen. And, and, and you know what? Uh, I, I think today... What we need is a repair of this, and not, not medicine-wise. Listen, this old flesh is going to go out the door one day, one way or the other, and either you like it or you don't like it, but you still be graveyard dead. But I mean, maybe the problem is, is the things we allow into our lives mm -hmm. and the things that we do. And, and, and what the repair needs to be, oftenly, uh, is just get rid of the bad stuff and the Lord will be down. So they had already been working for some time. And so if you start this idea, if you uh, if you embrace it, don't think that living for the Lord one day and voila, you're going to feel like a million bucks because it's not going to happen. Yeah. It takes work. Right. If you have any measure of prayer life <laughs> at all, it takes work. Uh, you know, these little now I lay me down to sleep. That's not prayer. In fact, the Bible warns us about repetition. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so when we really get a hold of God, it, it's a totally different thing. And, and so as they're approaching this and getting ready to worship again, uh, there had to be some preparation. Verse 16. And the children of Israel, the priest and the Levites, and the rest of the children of captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. Now, if you follow the history of Israel, this is really the second temple, but it really wasn't either. It was a repair of the first temple, and they would build a new temple a little bit later, and then finally that would be abolished 70 years after the days of Christ. And there would be no temple, and there's not been a temple since then. And so they had been done some repair work to prepare for the worship of God. Now, I ask you this, you know, I studied, and I prayed, and I tried to prepare this morning. My, ask, uh, my question for you is, did you prepare? Uh, you know, uh, as the old saying goes, I can't do it all myself. And uh, it takes the church to prepare for right. prayer. And, and so we find that everybody was involved, not just the Levites, not just the priests, but the whole congregation was involved in this preparation for worship. Verse 17, And they offered of the dedication of this house of God a hundred bullocks, two hundred grams, and four hundred lambs. So if you, if you count that up, they give a 700-fold uh, a, a, a uh, offering to the name of the Lord. Now, seven is the number of perfection or the number of God, and they needed, to, uh, they needed a blood sacrifice. Now, isn't it a wonderful thing today that our blood sacrifice is done? The blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ was sufficient for all his people that ever would be. He covered their sin. But I want you to see this. It cost them something. Mm -hmm. See, we live in a day and age today where our service to the Lord really don't cost us anything. And it's flimsy. And it's unkept. But see, if we really, if we really want a service to the Lord that's genuine, it's going to cost you something. It may cost you friends. It may cost you uh, family members. But is it not worth it in the light of eternity? Right. 
And, and, and that's certain where, well, certainly where we ought to be. So they freely give these things, just like the wandering children of Israel. We know we, we touched on that a little bit. Maybe it was in Jared's class, I don't know, or maybe it was uh, last Sunday after I was done preaching. I'm not sure that when they were hungry on that trip from Egypt and they had that wandering for 40 years because of their sin, and the whole time they were eating these little wafers that fell from the Almighty to the ground, and what we forget is they had cattle with them. That they had out hundreds of cattle from Israel. I mean, from Egypt, excuse me. Uh, what they do with them? Well, I'll tell you what they, they slaughtered them for a sacrifice. Again and again, because remember the wilderness tab tabernacle was there, and they were worshiping God in the wilderness tabernacle, and to worship in those days, you had to have a blood offering. And, and, and so those were restricted to the service of God. Now, I ask you this morning, what do you have that is restricted exclusively to the service of God? Now, some of us might say the Lord's Day. That's good if you really give it to Him. And I don't mean I don't mean two hours on Sunday. I mean give the whole day to Him. Uh, that's why we call it the Lord's Day, right? right. And, and and so we we began to understand that maybe just maybe we're, we're somewhat in the condition that Israel was when this took place, verse 18. And they set priests in their divisions and Levites in their courses for the service of God. Now, I want you to see that everybody had a position and everybody got in his position. Now, I'm the pastor here. That's my position. And you may be a prayer person and that's your position. You may be a, a Sunday school teacher. That's your position. But whatever it is, you know what? I don't believe the Lord saves people just to take up room. Do you? I really don't. I believe he, he saves them purposefully for a purpose. And we need to find whatever that is and get in it. So we find the Levites and the priests, and then it says, and all the others of the captivity getting in their place. And, and so certainly as the Lord's people, uh, we need to be in a place. You know what? The most important place is not the pastor. What I have found after 25 years of pastoring, the most important place is this, and that's find a place to pray. And pray and pray and then pray some more. That, 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 that you need to pray for me, you need to pray for New Testament Church, you, you, you need to pray for our missionaries. That's what is the best place that you can be in. Verse 19. And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. And if you follow the Jewish instruction in the law of Moses, that's nice, and, or about April, somewhere in that. Uh, in that for us uh, thank God we don't have to do that but they, they kept the Passover now remember the Passover was initiated the night they left Egypt they kept it for 40 years wandering in the wilderness which I don't think they really kept it in travel that's just my own opinion but then they reinstituted when they got to Canaan and if you remember they even circumcised some of the children and they, they reinstituted it, and, and then for some probably 400 years, they observed it with detail. And then because they let some of the other people in, and we'll get to the meat of the message now, they let heathen in, they let a tribe survive. You remember we read that very recently in Adam's class when they let Joshua let some of them live. And, and you know, it seems cruel and heartless for people to die as they were possessing the land. But see, the real, the real message of that is not that we should go out and kill people, but it's to stomp that junk out of your lives. Take it all together. See, that's our problem today. And I know for 25 years, I've preached on separation. It seems to be the theme of my ministry. But see, there's a reason behind it. We need to stamp that junk out of our lives right. so we might have power with God. Yeah. That, and, and it really comes down 
uh, to what you're going to do, well, where is your dedication at? And so they observed the Passover on this occasion. Uh, verse 20, and the priest and the Levites were purified together. All of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity, for their brethren and their priests and for themselves. Now, you read this uh, this week in the Passover, I mean, the Passover sacrifice was specific. It was, it, it names who it's for there. You see what I'm saying? And that was the ones that got right. So if it was specific the way that it was written, we would have to come to the conclusion the ones back in captivity, they didn't get it. They didn't observe. And one thing, they were in captivity. They, they, you know, when Ezra and them came down, they didn't bring everybody. In fact, the, the, the king only let them bring a certain number, right? So there were some people not doing it. There were some people not participating, whatever the reason may be. And you know what? That's what I found. A great deal has not changed among God's people, even though now we are the Gentile race. Some people just ain't doing it. And you know what? I'll go even further. And some people are determined they're not going to do it. Yeah. Right? And, and so we find then, uh, as the Lord's people, nothing has really changed that much uh, as he comes into the new order of the Gentile race. Uh, verse 21. And the children of Israel, which were come again out of captivity, and all such had separated themselves unto, uh, unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land, and to seek the Lord their God of Israel did eat, meaning the Passover supper. Now, I want you to notice a number of things uh, that captivity taught some people some things. Now, in that captivity, you have, you have Daniel, and you have the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they made some decisions for God, didn't they? In captivity. Now they're out of captivity, and they have, you, you, they're zealous. Remember when the Lord first saved you? And, and, and he gave you newness of life, and you knew your sins were forgiven, and you knew your home would be glory one day. Well, what a wonderful thing that was, and how zealous you were for the things of God. That was kind of the condition of these men. You know what? Uh, what I have found, if you ain't living for Christ, you don't appreciate your redemption very much. Right? Almost like something you deserve. Well, listen, let me tell you this. Nobody's told you before. You, What our real deserves were was to split hell wide open. That's what we deserved. And that's what would have been just and right, but Christ intervened. Amen. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, uh, really self-evaluation is necessary this morning. Are we on or are we off? Have we separated ourselves unto Christ? Now, listen, I don't mean choosing Christ. I don't believe in that. But I do believe this. There's a degree in which you can serve him. That's why some had 30 folds, some had 60, and some had 100. And you know what? I think we're running on about 30 or 20 in the, in the modern day, don't you? Yes. You know, me and Donna, we give up on our garden this year pretty early. We give up on it every year, but this time earlier than usual. And because the, the deer just ate it up. And we put more seed out than we got back. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and I dare say, uh, that's most people's situation today. Um, we're just not in there. But if we could go back and, and, and think of the time the Lord saved us and what a marvelous work he worked in an unbodily, unworthy, unfit for nothing vessel, then certainly we would begin to praise him again. But in the modern day, certainly that's not what we uh, like to hear. Now, I want to go very quickly 
uh, just for time's sake and, and, and read a couple of other spots in Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9, and we'll just read verse 2, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 1 for time's sake. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, and the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Now, I want you to see what they're saying is, as they were getting closer to the Lord, they were finding more problems. Now, that, that, that should walk with the Lord in the modern day, if you really want to walk with him, and that's how it is to me. The more I say, Lord, I want to be near unto thee, the more problems I see with me. And then, and then by his grace, I take care of that problem, and then I get a little closer, and I see another problem. And you know why? It's just filthy, stinking flesh, and it's always going to be this way. Yeah. But what a wonderful thing. You, you remember the Apostle John, the way I understand, about a 15-year-old boy at the time of Christ, and he laid his head over and said, Lord, is done. He didn't even trust himself enough that he might be the deceiver. You see, that's where we need to be. We need to be on the Lord Jesus' breast and say, is done. You church dry and, uh, dry and troubled this morning, is it I? Uh, there's no spirit left in your life, is it I? And you know what I found among Baptist people is this. Listen, you find problems with all kinds of other people. <laughs> well, I know it's Sally. She's made the church dry again. But when you point at Sally, about four more point back at you. Amen. Right? And so then we as the Lord's people... And you know, all you can really deal with is what your issues are, not mine, not your wife's. You just have to deal with your own, right? And so then we as the Lord's people, we, we, we must take an evaluation of ourselves and look, listen, what is really going on? What am I doing? Now, one more, uh, one more place there in Ezra 10 verse 11. Ezra 10 and verse 11, the Bible says, Now therefore make confession unto the Lord of your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate from the people in the land. Now we find out it's a pleasure to God when we separate. Now listen, when we're spreading the gospel, we don't have to take up the attitude of the heathen, don't do it. Listen, you'll never be a witness uh, to the potheads by smoking pot with them. You see what I'm saying? You, 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 it don't work that way. What we have to do is go to them and preach Christ and leave it there. You're not the Holy Ghost anyway, right? Just preach Christ and leave it there because see, from personal experience, I know if you'll take, if you begin to take on their ways, you'll be just like them in, in a very short amount of time. You'll be just like them. And, and so we find then that the reason for separation from this verse is because it's pleasing to God. Right? Don't you want to be a pleasing vessel unto the Lord? No, don't, don't you want to be one that's useful? That, that he set aside for a purpose and one day he'll take it he'll take it down and say I'm going to use this today but if you're full of, if you're full of the filth of this world he's not going to use you he, he, uh, you're not a useful vessel unto him all right let's bring this uh, one more one more thing in the book of Nehemiah because these were uh, concurrent prophets uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 uh, verse 2 Nehemiah chapter 9 in uh, verse 2 the Bible says and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities with their fathers now I, I will point out two things first of all that uh, 
they separated themselves. You, you see the recurrent theme. If we want the hour of God, we can't look and be like the world. Right. It, 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 it's, it, it's not congruent. You see what I'm saying? And then after they separated themselves, they began to confess things unto God. Now, I think I said this last week and maybe even the week before that. But listen, I'm old enough to remember when people would confess sin. Uh, uh, that, you know, they, they would say, I, I, I'm sorry I've let the church down. I'm sorry I've let sin in my life. Uh, and even to the point they go and say, listen, I'm sorry my children are not doing the way they ought to. You know, you say, well, you can't confess sin for nobody else. I understand that. But certainly Job came up with the same idea, didn't he? And, and, and so we find then as the Lord's people, what we, what we ought to be doing is saying, yeah, I'm involved in that. Yeah, I've done that. There are things taking priority in my life over the Lord. You know, that, that's a debauched sin even if, in and even of itself. That, that Christ is not primary in our life. Now, I want you to go with me to 2 Corinthians, and, and we'll bring it over to the New Testament doctrines that you'll see. The ones everybody wants to skip over because they're not pleasant. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, if you know your Bible history, this is the second epistle to the Corinthian church. And Paul had kind of took hide, hair, and all with the first time around. Uh, brought into, brought into uh, very, told them, and very easy, specifically told them in 1 Corinthians 5, this is your problem. That woman, uh, that man running with his stepmother, that's your problem. He says, next time you come together, get him out. That's pretty bold, isn't it? And, 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 but then again, if the Corinthians wanted power with the Almighty, that was their only choice. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, uh, verse 11 the Bible says, O oh, ye Corinthians, you ever thought about a, a letter that would be written to your home church? Uh, you know, uh, if they, if Paul wrote one, I don't know what, I don't think we'd be the Doverinians, maybe the Doverites. I don't know how he would say that. But began to list the good things and the problems of the church at Dover. That's very humbling to me because, see, I'm responsible for this. And, and it ought to be humbling to you, too. And, and, and so we find then, as he is uh, bringing it back that the attention ought to be on the church there at Corinth, he, uh, he says, O oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is opened unto you. Our heart is enlarged. In other words, he loved them even more than he did before. You know what? When, when you love somebody, you'll tell them, you'll tell them even if it's a problem. Y'all know mama's been sick. And, and I try to take her out to eat every Saturday. And, and, and she, you know, uh, this is why I think she's had a stroke. This side of her mouth droops a little bit. And sometimes she'll get a little food right there. And either I'll get it or I'll say, Mother, wipe your mouth. You say, well, why would you do that? Well, I don't want to go around looking like that. That's a problem. You know what? And I know this, when she was a young woman, it had been an embarrassment to her. And so, somebody needs to tell us the problems, don't they? Now, I could go ahead and let Mama look like she was a four-month-old baby with food running down her mouth, but I know she'd do the same for me. Right. And so I ask you then, are you going to say, listen, this may be a problem for you, or are you going to ignore the issue? But we find that Paul was very excited about the changes in the church there at Corinth. Verse 13, now for, for a recompense in the same, or a repay, I'm sorry, I'm going to get verse 12. Ye are not straightened in us, ye are straightened in your own bowels. 
Now, he had given them a very wonderful message in the first uh, in the first Corinthian letter, but he said, hey, wait a minute. I didn't straighten you out. And, and, and in that time, they believed that the, the bowels was the center of the body, not the heart. And so he's saying, you're straightened at your very center, the center of your body, because, see, they had straightened themselves out in the sense that they got their heart right. And uh, he says, I can't do that for you. Now, as your pastor, I can't get you straightened out. Now, if you was like me, Mama used to whip us pretty good, and I always wanted to cut it down, and I've often wondered if it's still there, that little house we grew up in. There was a peach tree right behind, just past the, the drive. The drive went around the back of the house, and that peach tree was right there. And listen, those limbs will cut you up, and they will wrap around your legs, and you'll wish you hadn't done it. But she still couldn't straighten me up. Now, I'd be good for a while, right? But if I thought she wasn't looking, you know what? I'd do something again. And that's a very that's a very same thing. Yeah. You can't straighten yourself up. Right. It takes a move of the Almighty. Yeah. Have you been saved or are you playing a game? Because see, saved people with the with the correction of the Almighty will straighten up. And lost people, you know what? They never will. And, and you know what? Unless the Lord saves their soul, they're incapable of it. That is their nature. And, and, and so we find that as Paul is writing uh, to the church, he's excited that the church's problems are not like they once were. You know what? It excites me when I see a church that's trying to serve God. And he was excited at the changes they had made. I'm assuming uh, that man that was running with his stepmother was gone. I, I, I believe those things had been set aside. And he was excited with their progress. Then he says this. Now, for a recompense or payment in the same, I speak unto you, my children, be ye also enlarged or uh, spiritually enlarged or increased. He says, I'm going to tell you something else. I'm so excited for what you did, I'm going to recompense you and tell you even more. See, isn't it a wonderful thing, maybe a verse you've read a thousand times in your Christian life, and all of a sudden, boom, it speaks to you. That's a recompense. He's keeping that in you. And sometimes it's, praise the Lord. And sometimes it's old me, <laughs> right? I've had them both. But you know what? They're still good for us, are they not? Uh, they're still exactly what we need. And, and so we find then, as Paul is writing, that he wanted them to go a little bit deeper. Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Very simple command, very applicable to our lives today. We don't need to be locked up with unbelievers. Now, uh, when my children got quarter age, my only thing, and, and you know, I don't call me snobby, not only did I want them to be with a believer, I wanted to be with a believer that believes like us. Because, you know, everybody says they're a believer in Christ. is not. I had a, a Mormon boy the other day. He's assigned to this area. And, and, we, and you know, nice young man, very respectful. But when I, when I put his feet to the fire, he was done with me. And you know what he would tell you? He would tell you, yes, I'm a Christian. Right? So, not only do I want my children to marry Christian people, I want them to, I want them to marry Baptist people. And, and, and so we find then, as Paul is writing, and that's just one thing about the oath. You know another thing? Anytime you make an oath or you make a promise, you're under obligation. Now listen, a promise today is given uh, and, and a commitment is given at the, at the snap of a finger. But you know what? Those are things given by the oracle of God. Donna and I have been married 32 years, and if she left me tomorrow, the way I understand the scriptures, at least the way God looks at it, we're still hooked up. So you better be choosy. You better, you better look around. What about these lodges and stuff? 
these, uh, you know, uh, kind of woodmen of the world and stuff like that. You know what? You be careful of the oath that you make. That's right. right. Be very cautious about it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, sororities at the college level. And all the, I, I had a dear friend in, in college, I ain't going to name her name, but she, very sweet girl, and we was riding around. We had a home health rotation together. And we was riding around looking for this house. And I, listen, being ignorant, and certainly I knew I didn't want to, me and Donnie went to college after we were married. And, uh, uh, and uh, she got to talking about her sorority. I, 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 you know, being ignorant, I just asked questions. I didn't really, I just kind of knew what they were. And this is what they do to join hers. I don't even remember the name of it. You get into a casket, they ask you some questions, and you burst forth. Mm-hmm. You know what that does? A mimicking of the new birth, is it mm-hmm. not? Right. That don't belong to a sorority. That belongs to God's people. So you be very careful of the oath you make. And, and so we find then that Paul advises the church at Corinth to be in the same mind. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers right. for what fellowship have darkness with unrighteous, what what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion have life with darkness? And, and if you think about that, that's a very true statement. You know what? We don't have anything uh, in common anyway, or we shouldn't. Right. Right. We we need to be very cautious. Um, I don't want fellowship with darkness. Now let me say this. There was a time in my life when I did, and shamedly, shame on Larry, uh, it was after I was saved. You know, uh, I'm ashamed to say this in front of a cast, but uh, one of the first rock concerts I went to was Motley Crue. I hope you guys never even heard of it. And uh, uh, I got there, and I was crooked. Pretty miserable. You know what? I didn't have fellowship. I, you know, I was there to be cool, but I really didn't have fellowship with them. You see, you see what I'm saying? My friends, man, they were like, Ooh. Oh, and, uh, but I didn't have any real fellowship with them. You know what? If you get that feeling when you're somewhere, the best thing you can do is leave. The, be- the best thing you can do is just get out. And, and, and so we find that his recommendation to the church at Corinth was to be separate, to come out of that mess. Verse 15, what, corn, what concord have with Christ with Belial, or what part that he that believeth with an infidel, or a non-believer, or an idolater? What, and what agreement have the temple of God with idols? And the answer is none whatsoever, or that should be. But see, we have agreement. Concord means agreement, right? We do, don't we? Uh, and I'll get told, I'll get told constantly at work that I'm weird. And I have to agree with them most of the time. But you know what? After, and I'm working mostly with retired military, and, and their mouth is just like stone water. But they will not say anything like that around me. And you know what? They know I don't have fellowship with them. They know I don't want to hear it. See, even though I'm in that, I still keep myself separated from it. And so I know from experience, you can. If that's your goal and that's your intent, the Lord will help you do that every time. And so he, he says, what are you agreeing to anyway? What, what do you have involved in that anyway? Verse 17, the solution. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. The very same thing we read in the Old Testament when they were having revival, when they were moving back into the temple. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Amen. Now, I have to take to meaning then. If you don't, he won't. <laughs> right? 
if you're eat up with this world. And, and I'm not saying necessarily that you're lost, but you won't have that sweet fellowship right. when he speaks to your heart. Right. <laughs> so when you go to him in prayer, and the room just filled with his presence. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah went to the temple, and the Bible says that the room was filled with, his, with, 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 with the presence of the Lord. It was filled with his veil. His veil filled the temple. See, we need more experiences like that, don't we? And the uncertainty that lies ahead, we need it every day. We need it every day. And so we find then that that was Paul's recommendation to the church, to the believers at Corinth. Now go with me to 2 Timothy. I mean, excuse me, 1 Timothy. Timothy was a young preacher. He had his plate full. Um, he was pastoring. And he was doing the work of an evangelist, according to 2 Timothy. And he was doing a whole lot for the service of the Lord. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. I will therefore that every man, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, how many people do you know in a good Baptist church that says, Blessed be the name of the Most High, the living God of all the Bible, the one that doeth things, what seemeth good unto himself? Now that's prayer. You didn't say pay my light bill. You didn't say fill my refrigerator. You lifted up the name of the Almighty. That's right. But you know, who gets the credit for this in the modern day? Now this is going by the Bible, lifting holy hands, right? Mm -hmm. Pentecostal people, right? Mm -hmm. If I did that, people would think I'd go insane. But that is what the Bible teaches. Right. And, and, and so I believe if we want to be really really filled and we really want to honor God and we really want to be separated to his service, we have to do things like this. Verse 9 In like manner also that the women ordain themselves in modest apparel. You know what? Uh, men by their very nature are enticed by what we see with these things right here. And listen, it ain't no, it ain't no saddle on a woman's back, but it's because of the nature of man. Listen, y'all put on some clothes that is modest. Right? How many people, uh, hey, where do you hear that today? But that is what the Bible teaches, is it not? Mm -hmm. Wear modest apparel. You know what? I see some today that honestly they just look like hoodlers. And I'm talking down at God's house, not, not out there on the road. I'm talking down at God's house. God help us as a people. We have that mess and we want to know where the presence of God is? Huh. Not going to happen, is it? Right. Not going to happen. And, and, and so we, then as the Lord's people, if we want the presence of God, then we're going to have to align ourselves with this once again. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety or control, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh women. Now you underline that in your Bible. Because listen, there is a garment in this good old U.S. of A that belongs to a woman, and there is a garment that belongs unto a man. If you don't uh, believe that, the next time you go to McDonald's and you're trying to find which one is yours, <laughs> look at the door. <coughs> right? No way around it. Now, we like the way around it, do we not? In the modern day, we don't want to like, talk about that. We don't want to run people off. But listen, the Bible says what it says. And in this, I want the power of God, then we should too. But that which becometh women professing godliness <coughs> with good works. And, and what a wonderful, wonderful thing that is. Last scripture before we close. 1 Corinthians. And as I said, this was... Obviously, before the second Corinthian letter, there was lots of issues down at Corinth that, that Paul was going to address, not because he wanted to be ugly, but because he cared for those people. He, he wanted their spiritual progression. Second Corinthians 
uh, I mean, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 10, the Bible says this. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now that is the very word that's translated angels in the book of Revelation, and it is uh, it's translated pastor sometime. So I don't know, I mean, I, I believe in the King James Bible, I have to believe it's an angelic being, but you look at it both ways. Verse 11. Nevertheless, is a man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Now, that means this. Uh, come over here. I'm by Donna, this is my wife, 32 years. Which one's a boy and which one's a girl? If we stood up and walked that way, how would you tell? Right? And so he said, you're, you're together in Christ. You're, you're a set, you're a pair. Then one of them is this way, and one of them is that way. You know, we live in a day and age today where sodomy is taking over our land. Listen, you know what? They ought not to marry. They ought not to be a couple. They ought not to have uh, the privilege of familyhood. The Bible says that what it, the Bible says this is a rare thing. It's a, it's a sin that God hates, right? Sodomy, yeah. I mean. Yeah. And, and and so we see then that we need to look like the gender that we are. Verse 13, judging yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doeth not nature, doeth not even nature itself teach you that it is a man, that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. Now, I've heard this one preached a lot. The first time that I heard it laid down like it ought to be, I had to go. I, I was with Donna before we was married. We was in a little church there at Bumpus Mills. And I mean, Roy Marcus Jr. blammed it out. And he may not have been, but I think he was looking at me the whole time. <laughs> and you know why? My hair was bound about right here. And you know what? I needed that preaching. It was like medicine to me. In all my years of going to church, no one ever preached that in my hearing. And you know what? I want to have that mess cut off. See, saved people will obey the Bible, and lost people will not. Right? And, and so we find then that uh, it's a shame. It, it, it is something that we ought to be embarrassed about, but we're not. But if a woman has long hair, it is glory. To her. For her hair is given her for a husband. Now, what I've seen in 25 years of ministry and 50 years plus of living on this earth, hair kind of goes in, in ups and downs, both men and women. Now, in the 80s, when I was a teenager, it was down for the men and up for the women. You know when, when cutting women's hair really became a thing? In the 1920s. First time you've seen it. One of the most wicked generations our nation has ever known. I used to hear my great grandmother say, we paid, we, paid, uh, uh, we paid for our sins in the 20s by living in the 30s. That was a rough time to live. She, got, she, she raised uh, seven children through the Great Depression. And see, we as the Lord's people, we don't need to look like the world at all. I want power with all my energy. I, I don't spend a life of so so Christian. I, I want to meet with him. I want him to come down and fill the house like he did in the days of Isaiah and the and the train fill the temple and we can feel his presence and know that we've met with him. Don't you don't you want that? Well, it's going to take some commitment. Um, that don't happen. And if you read the first six, uh, five chapters of Isaiah, all he was was mad. <laughs> he, 
He was mad at Israel for the way they'd done. But you know what? He had no genuine love for them. After that experience in Isaiah chapter 6, his heart pulls a torch out to them because he loves them. What's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. So when you see a situation, don't go in like a, a bull in a china shop. Go in there and love them and present the word in truth. But not like it, not, not like you're going to come out there with heads on the, on the street. Pray for them. You know, I traveled from place to place and I, I met a lot of men I didn't know last weekend. And what I tried to do after I left them is pray for them. Don't know them from Adam, but I'm praying for them. So what about you this morning? How, how close are you to the Lord? I mean, really, when you get down to it and, and you don't have to tell me and you don't have to tell your spouse, but when it comes down to it, how close are you to the Lord? And if you're not real close, What's the problem? What's the issue? Because I'll guarantee you this. It's not with the Almighty. Right. He's always good and faithful. Mount Zion 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. So it must be us, must it? And you have to get down to very individualistic things. And we really don't like that, do we? But it's the only way it can be. Being, uh, being, being individual.